Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us today for this uh, webinar. We're doing our December webinar on the subject of transmission transitions and uh, have a really superb panel for you today of experts um, in various aspects of what is happening in the realm of transmission and how things are changing in response to the uh, FERC orders that are trying to open up more competition into the field of electricity transmission. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists as, as it's their turn to speak, and we're asking each panelist to speak for about uh, 10 minutes or up to as much as 15 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience. So I want the audience members, please look at your questions tab on your computer, which is part of the go to meeting um, control panel and feel free to type in your questions at any time and i'll be watching for the questions to come in and then uh, when it's time for discussion and questions i'll feed them to the panelists so our first panelist today is the honorable john wellinghoff former commissioner from the federal energy regulatory commission and in fact the longest serving chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission ever serving as chairman from 2009 to 2013. And um, Mr. Wellinghoff was instrumental in getting some of these uh, changes to be passed and he's got the background on that and perspective that he's going to share with us in just a moment. Um, he's now formed a firm called Grid Policy Incorporated that is dedicated to furthering the deployment and investment in clean and sustainable and distributed energy resources and uh, incredible background in this field. So we're very pleased to have him with us today. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Wellinghoff and then audience, we're going to skip ahead to sl his slide number seven. So you'll see the other slides go quickly on the screen while Mr. Wellinghoff starts his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tom, uh, and thank you. Um, I want to appreci appreciate very much uh, NRRI for having me <coughs> uh, participate in this webinar today. Yeah, we're going to uh, adapt uh, a slide presentation that I did um, and have done in the past on uh, using distributed energy resources as alternative transmission solutions, and uh, we're going to actually talk about all alternative transmission solutions, including more traditional ones and how they fit into the structure of the uh, FERC's uh, overall uh, orders related to transmission, transmission planning, and the requirements under those orders uh, related to the issue of competition and how competition can be uh, functionally incorporated uh, into that process. Um, overall, and the first slide we have up here now, um, overall, FERC uh, set forth uh, three uh, basic broad criteria uh, when eval evaluating uh, different transmission solutions uh, that need to be met um, for uh, determining uh, those, those solutions to transmission problems. The first, of course, being reliability, uh, keeping the lights on is job one. Um, and ensuring that um, under fail failure scenarios or peak load conditions uh, that that transmission grid uh, can meet uh, those requirements uh, under the NERC uh, requirements, the, the uh, National uh, Electric Reliability Corporation's requirements that FERC uh, ultimately implements into rules. Um, the first thing that those transmission planners do is, is determine whether or not they are maintaining their reliability requirements. Second one, of course, is economics uh, related to uh, congestion and whether or not uh, costs can be reduced for consumers. So uh, number one is reliability. Number two is efficiency from an economic perspective to ensure that uh, the solutions uh, provide uh, cost-effective reductions in overall market uh, costs uh, by providing for better delivery uh, through the transmission system. And the final one that we put in uh, to the rules uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later is policy. Uh, whether or not there is 
uh, policy driven need for that transmission and that policy need can be either a federal policy or a state policy uh, such thing such thing as the Clean Air Act requirements uh, uh, under the EPA um, or um, things as a state RPS so those things uh, are to be considered by the planners in looking at the overall requirements for transmission planning. Uh, next, Neil, or uh, I'm sorry, next, uh, Tom. So um, getting selected and compensating as a transmission solution um, for the assets to be approved and be FERC jurisdictional, it must first fulfill uh, a transmission need, number one. Um, uh, second, it has to meet the performance requirements established by the ISO. In other words, if there's a reliability requirement, it has to, in fact, solve that reliability requirement. Um, it has to be selected by the ISO R R so, uh, RTO during uh, their competitive process. Um, and I'll go into that in, in a little bit more detail later. But ultimately, um, it was set forth uh, for the first time in Order 1000 that there can be uh, competitive consideration of alternative solutions. And um, those uh, competitive alternatives are uh, looked at by the ISO, RTO in their planning process, and that's where uh, ultimately those solutions uh, can be selected, selected on a competitive basis. And each ISO RTO has the criteria that they use in that competitive process. The criteria are a little bit different in each ISO RTO. Uh, FERC allowed for those differences in approving the, the uh, over 1,000 compliance plans, uh, but they all ultimately, uh, at the end, uh, are intended to select the best competitive solution that, again, meets uh, the transmission needs to, to meet that, uh, that solution uh, that is, is required uh, to fulfill the requirements for the, for the grid area. Um, it has to provide a transmission service function, of course. It has to comply with FERC guidelines on, on, on cost-based versus market-based revenue. And here this relates to uh, assets that may be able to uh, provide both uh, uh, transmission services and non-transmission services, and this would uh, apply to distributed energy resources uh, primarily or uh, resources like storage uh, that would be in front of the meter that could, could provide both functions. Uh, next, Tom, please. So if we look at analysis of the awards uh, in the ISOs, and this is data from uh, FERC's own report, uh, from their, their, their 2017 uh, uh, staff report um, that looked at what the ISOs had been doing uh, since 2013 uh, regarding awarding uh, transmission uh, projects to non-incumbents in their area, uh, i.e. this is under a competitive process. You can see that CAISO uh, California ISO uh, is far and ahead uh, of any other uh, um, ISO in awarding projects to non-incumbents. So they awarded nine projects, or excuse me, five projects out of out of nine uh, went to non non-incumbents. Uh, PGM, on the other other hand, only awarded uh, one out of 119, and you can see uh, that um, none of the others uh, of the ISOs have awarded projects to non-incumbents. So um, even though uh, this is something that is um, provided for in FERC regulations and something that the ISOs are required to do in their planning process, that is consider competitive solutions, the facts show that uh, we've seen very, very little of this uh, being done uh, in the ISOs since that, that rule went into place. Uh, next, Tom. So quickly then, let's go over the history of these orders and how we got to where we are now uh, with this competitive process from a legal and a regulatory standpoint. And I'll look at, at order 888, uh, 890, and order um, 1000 ultimately. So looking at order 888, uh, that really uh, was the order that provided for the legal definition of transmission, 
something capable of providing transmission services. So uh, that then opened it up broadly to, uh, again, allow for these alternative transmission solutions, not only uh, um, traditional infrastructure by non-incumbents, but also uh, things like uh, storage, demand response, distributed generation, uh, anything that in individually or in aggregate that could provide a transmission service uh, ultimately uh, could be defined as transmission. And then it defines what transmission services are, uh, transmitting electrons and or scheduling dispatching services, load following, energy imbalance service, system protection service, reactive power and voltage control service, or a loss compensation service. These are all defined in Order 888 as transmission services. Next, please. Then in Order 890, this was the, uh, the first order that did require planning of all transmission owners uh, under FERC's jurisdiction in the U.S. So FERC, of course, has jurisdiction over all transmission owners with the exception of Texas and ERCOT. That is under the um, uh, Texas Commission, and Order 890 was the first order that required there be planning on a on a yearly basis, and it defined the transmission planning principles uh, that it be coordinated, that it be open, transparent, that there be an information exchange, uh, that there be comparability uh, with respect to that planning process, and that there be a dispute resolution process if if there are disputes about uh, particular solutions and that there also be some level of regional participation and that they use economic planning studies and that they have a cost allocation method for allocating the costs once the transmission uh, solutions uh, are set upon and developed, that they are able to allocate costs uh, among the, uh, the users of the system. Uh, next, please. The comparability provision of Order 890, um, and I'll just read it here uh, out of the order, is when evaluating the merits of such alternative transmission solutions, which includes there a reference uh, to uh, a very important provision of the Energy Policy Act of 2000, 2005, that's Section 1223, which defines what alternative transmission, uh, well, excuse me, what defines what advanced transmission technologies are and includes a whole list of items which include distributed generation, storage, demand response, uh, controls, and uh, other uh, devices that people don't traditionally think of as transmission, but ult ultimately are in fact defined by Congress as advanced transmission technologies. Well, uh, when evaluating the merits of those types of, of solutions and of course, uh, traditional ones, public utility transmission providers in the transmission planning region must all cons consider proposed alternatives on a comparable basis. So if someone comes in an al with an alternative, whether it be a, tra a traditional one that is, um, you know, lines and wires, substation, etc., to the incumbent or a non-traditional one, uh, such as these other things that are defined by Congress in Section 1223, they have to be uh, uh, supposedly looked at by that ISO on a comparable basis. And if the public utility transmission providers in the planning region, in consultation with stakeholders, determine that an alternative transmission solution is more efficient or cost effective than transmission of facilities in one or more local, trans local transmission plans, then the transmission facilities associated with that more efficient or cost effective transmission solution can be selected in the regional transmission plan for purposes of cost allocation. Now, it doesn't say it must be selected. It would be nice if it said that, um, but it gives a level of discretion to the planners. In the case of the ISOs, it's the ISOs. In the case outside of the ISOs, it's the regional groups who do the planning, but at least it sets up this comparability requirement, and this is where the real heart of the competitive analysis comes from uh, in uh, the FERC orders. It's in this paragraph in Order 890. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at one particular case, we can look at Western Grid Development. There was the declaratory order uh, request to FERC. Uh, this was on under Order 890. This actually came in 2010. This was before Order uh, 1000 came out. 
And it basically um, claimed that in this case, a developer wanted to put a battery into the KISO uh, grid and indicated that it was an advanced transmission technology under section 1223. Um, and in fact, it mimicked transmission services uh, under the uh, provisions of the order that FERC wrote here. And in, in fact, FERC declared this was uh, transmission infrastructure and could be rate-based. Uh, this, this solution, interesting enough, uh, was not selected ultimately because it, it was not determined to be cost-effective from a cost-effective standpoint uh, based upon that previous paragraph, but it was declared by FERC in this declaratory order to in fact be transmission infrastructure. So here you can see that there are a number of alternatives for competitive solutions that in fact can be rate-based uh, and, and will be, con be uh, considered by FERC to be transmission infrastructure. Next, please. So Order 1000, um, what it did is it, it, it took 890 uh, one step further. It required tra uh, transmission owners to participate in regional transmission planning. Where under 890, they could plan individually on their own, but here they were required to participate in regional planning. Of course, that is done in the ISOs, but even outside of the ISO regions, uh, they had to form their own regional groups. Uh, it, inf it reinforces that comparability. It reinforces the use of advanced transmission technologies as alternative transmission solutions. And in fact, Order 1000 cites the Western Grid case, and it also eliminates the right of first refusal uh, in most instances. That is, it, there was this provision um, that was uh, sort of historical um, uh, practice it was not necessarily in, uh, in in law per se, but was in uh, some tariffs of some of these uh, transmission uh, planners that said that the incumbent had the right to have first refusal on these projects. And FERC said there is no such thing in federal law, eliminated it, although uh, that's been clawed back to some degree by some of the states, and I think one of the other presenters is going to talk about that some. So, um, in conclusion here, um, with recommendations, um, ultimately there's, there's much more to be done, I think, to truly ensure that transmission can be competitive both for uh, alternative transmission solution stakeholders, uh, that is both ones that have um, non-conventional types of technologies like battery storage, et cetera, and for uh, non-incumbents as well. These people need to step up as stakeholders in the transmission planning processes in the ISOs, present their solutions and have those solutions comparably considered and participate fully. Uh, certainly the ISOs I think need to open those processes more fully uh, to those entities and I think the state commissions need to consider that in fact this is a way to lower costs for consumers by having a more competitive process uh, in this transmission planning and transmission development process, we'll get uh, better better projects that are lower cost uh, that will drive down costs for consumers. Now, with respect to FERC, as I mentioned in that one portion of Order 890, uh, perhaps we may, may want to change that may to a shall uh, in that one provision. Um, you know, I think we should be selecting the most cost-effective solutions unless there's some reason to not do that. And so with that, uh, thank you all, uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we'll uh, come back to questions again later. Everyone uh, on the audience, please type in your questions into the questions box that's part of your control panel. And I'm going to introduce our next presenter, Neil Millar. Uh, Neil is Executive Director of Infrastructure Development for the California ISO, and as you just heard, the California ISO is maybe farther down this road than any of the other ISOs at this point in time, with quite a bit of experience in opening up uh, opportunities for competitive supplies and then selecting those competitive suppliers to build projects. Uh, Neil has been responsible for the planning process at the California ISO. He's, he joined them in November of 2010. So he's been there about eight years, a little more than eight now. And um, he also operates the interconnection application process. 
He's a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan with a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering. So welcome, Neil. Uh, go right ahead. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to talk on the panel today. Uh, so I would just like to move through the slides. Maybe if I could move to the more generic who's the ISO slide. Um, to the next slide, Tom, please. Yeah, so just to uh, touch on it, obviously the uh, ISO is heavily uh, involved in the market operation primarily. The transmission planning aspect is also very important to us. There is a uh, uh, one distinction I want to set out right up front, which is that the ISO's transmission planning process is for both uh, local and regional expansion planning in our system. It does not include things like capital maintenance or life cycle replacement programs. Oh, if we could just go back a few uh, to the process slide, page three. Yes, so, um, so we do look at expansion. Okay, I think we're settling on page three, great. Um, the, uh, the ISO's planning process, like I said, focuses on both local and regional, but expansion planning. Each year we go through our annual transmission planning cycle that takes about 16 months, so we do have an overlap. It's very carefully structured to identify issues, and sometimes those issues have to carry forward into the next year's plan. First phase is developing our study assumptions for each year. We work very heavily with uh, state regulatory agencies, the Energy Commission and Public Utilities Commission for input assumptions into our planning process. Besides being the right thing to do, it also facilitates getting permits down the road. Our phase two process is where we do a detailed analysis identifying the needs and actually recommending solutions. Our board approves that transmission plan in March of each year. And if there are projects that are eligible for competitive solicitation that are part of that approved plan, we then move into the competitive solicitation process. Projects that are, aren't eligible are directly assigned to the incumbent transmission owner. Um, let's see if I could just move to slide four, please. I'm sorry, are we? Yeah, everybody else is on slide four or it's in the process of loading now. You're, oh. It must be loading okay. slower on your computer. Go right ahead. Okay, um, okay, so slide four. Um, regional transmission facilities are eligible for competitive solicitation. In the ISO, uh, the regional uh, transmission is defined as being over 200 kV. The uh, as I mentioned earlier, the projects have to be approved by the board as part of our annual comprehensive transmission plan. We do have a latitude or framework in place for smaller under $50 million projects that can be moved forward on an accelerated basis if need be. Now, the ones that are eligible for competitive solicitation are basically regional projects that are greenfield. So what is not eligible are any uh, less than 200 kV facilities or facilities that are really an upgrade or improvement or an addition to an existing PTO's facilities, a participating transmission owner's facilities. So it is very much a bid-based approach of us landing on a solution and then taking that out. Uh, let's see, if we could move to slide five. And if I'm just, mine system's just slow at loading, just let me know if I'm there. So I have some material. Here. Okay, I have some material here focusing on the competitive solicitation process itself. Uh, we believe it's fairly open and transparent. Uh, our transmission plan itself includes a high-level planning functional specification for each solution that's eligible for competitive solicitation. Uh, we have a number of selection factors that we take into account in picking the uh, ultimate successful applicant to be the project sponsor for that facility, but uh, we also identify in the original functional spec if any of the particular selection factors are particularly critical or what we call key selection factors. We do also host information, an informational conference once we open the, the bid window 
to make sure that our stakeholders are uh, well informed about the process and understand what they need to take to care take care of to move forward. We do also have a process for open questions to be submitted. Um, we don't identify who asked the question, but we post answers for the question and all answers for all interested parties to view. So there's no separate Q&A done behind the scenes with any one developer. We've been very successful, I should say, with having uh, very well qualified people participating in these processes. And I'll touch more on that later. Uh, moving to slide six, um, running this process is not without cost. We do have a study deposit requirement and the cost of running each particular project's competitive solicitation process is divided up among the people that move forward in participating in that competition. So there's an upfront deposit of $75,000. Uh, if that collected from all the parties isn't sufficient, we can bill for more but the total cost will not exceed $150,000 uh, per project sponsor per application. So if the same sponsor is competing in multiple bids, um, they could be affected that way. Now that, that uh, cost includes validating, qualifying sponsors, and ultimately selecting the approved project sponsor. If I could move to slide seven, please. So, uh, as I mentioned before, there are a few stages inside the competitive solicitation process itself. It includes validating and giving uh, people that are bidding on these projects an opportunity to cure certain deficiencies within their application process. We also then go through a process of qualifying the particular sponsors that have applied uh, for the particular project. And uh, that's particularly important to us because uh, if for some reason, let's say we had three people participating in a competition and two dropped out, we're obliged to assign the project to the third party, providing we have already qualified them. So the qualifications are not taken um, uh, to be a trivial matter because uh, to qualify someone and move them forward means we have to be comfortable with that party uh, if they ended up being the approved sponsor, whether through winning the competition or by being the only party that stayed in through the whole process. Out of the people that are qualified and moving forward, we then do a comparative analysis, which takes several months and leads with us posting a report identifying the approved project sponsor and providing a fairly detailed discussion of each selection criteria and what led to that particular party winning that bid. If I could move to slide eight, please. So the selection criteria itself is a holistic evaluation. We do not have preset weights for each evaluation criteria. We think that would severely limit the flexibility to evaluate a wide range of projects. So we have not been open to going there. We've had certain stakeholders that have been pretty vehement about how they believe that's a better way to do it. Uh, but we're not there and we haven't seen a reason to make that shift. Um, we, I should touch on costs. Costs and cost management are a very important part of our selection criteria and are normally identified as one of the key criteria. However, uh, cost estimates are not taken too seriously unless they are either backed by um, a, a binding commitment, which we would then carry forward into the regulatory process, um, or they're used to support uh, or they're supported by a project sponsor's proven capability to manage their costs on projects very effectively. So those are the two ways that cost estimates can be taken into account, but a cost estimate itself is not used as a primary determinant unless it has some other commitment attached to it. If I could move to the next slide, please. Uh, after we've selected the approved project sponsor, we do have to put in place what we call an approved project sponsor agreement, recognizing that not all of the winners are already participating transmission owners. We need a way to enforce obligations in both directions from the time the sponsor has been selected until the project actually 
comes online and the owner becomes a participating transmission owner. Uh, a party can't become a participating transmission owner unless they already have transmission. So the agreement covers uh, all of the high points of getting through the construction and commissioning period and making sure that we are getting what we need out of the process, as well as giving uh, certain comfort to the transmission owner as they move forward without having the benefit of a FERC approved tariff yet. If I could move to slide 10. So uh, yes, there was a comment earlier about uh, the number of processes we've run. We have made selections among competing offers in nine processes. I do see people listing at different times, uh, one party either being an incumbent or not an incumbent. We, had, we awarded one project to a party that is an existing transmission owner. They're not an ISO participating transmission owner. So we normally considered that to not be an incumbent, but they are in the area and have other infrastructure. Now, a few of these projects have since been canceled for other reasons, but the bulk of them are moving forward. And um, it's also not as clear as saying that it's an incumbent or non-incumbent because we've also seen a number of projects awarded to partnerships where there is both a conventional incumbent utility as well as other parties that participated as a team in winning a particular bid. So uh, that hybrid solution also has popped up a number of times. Let's see. Uh, the last point I just wanted to touch on, if I could move to page 11, please, is that we have made a few refinements um, over the years. Uh, the basic framework of our competitive solicitation process had been set out in a revised transmission planning process that had been filed in 2010 and approved early in 2011. Uh, we did have to make some adjustments to fully align with FERC Order 1000. We were very close on most issues, but we did have to make some refinements to be fully compliant for regional planning. And of course, the interregional process was, was a whole new set of tariff provisions. And we have been making uh, some improvements to the process as we go through that have more been uh, mechanical, streamlining certain parts of the process and providing some additional flexibility as opposed to a, a design overhaul. So uh, that, in addition, this is where I will stop presenting material. I did also though provide some additional background material that stakeholders might find of interest. And I'll look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. I'm uh, paging through those uh, added slides that are part of the package that you can look at um, in, at your leisure audience, and you can get all of the slide presentations from the NRRI website if you do not already have them. They're indexed with uh, today's webinar announcement and the registration page. I'm now going to introduce Sharon Segner, Vice President at LS Power Development which is a limited liability company. And Sharon's company has been active in building some of these projects as a competitive transmission um, company that's uh, actually participating in the bidding processes and then has been awarded some of these opportunities to be the entity that builds the projects. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to hear from someone who's actually part of the process on the other side, not the ISO, but one of the companies engaged in the competitive transmission business. Sharon, I want to turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for um, inviting LS Power to be a panelist in this discussion. And we're very appreciative for the opportunity to provide a few thoughts and comments. Um, in terms of our thoughts on the state of Order 1000. You know, for years, we um, act, after Order 1000 came out, we tried just to kind of keep our head down and focus on um, Order 1000 being established across the country. But I do think that we are to the point where we are starting to see some trends, um, starting to see some positive trends. And then I also think we're to the point where we're starting to see some trends of concern. And so in terms of my comments today, we'd like to try to give equal airtime to the positive trends 
as well as um, some of the trends of concern. And as you can see from uh, the map on the screen, LS Power, we are a national uh, player in the independent power space. Um, we um, own generation assets um, as well as transmission assets. And we are uniquely situated in the Order 1000 space, um, well, perhaps with one or two other companies, where we are qualified in um, almost every region of the United States um, in terms of as an Order 1000 participant. And so the comments that we make today are more from a national perspective, and we have more of the perspective of being in the ins and outs of all these different markets and having um, just a national perspective on how well it's going or where there are challenges. And so the next slide, um, in, the, uh, in terms of really getting into the substance, so the good news um, on Order 1000, what we see nationally across the country is that we think that the qualification process is working, has worked very well with Order 1000. Um, in order to participate in these Order 1000 windows, um, companies have to put out their qualifications to the regions and the RTOs. And we think that a lot of the initial concerns that people had about new entrants, um, that there would be you know, um, unqualified folks that are participating in these bids, et cetera, we think that many of those concerns have not come to fruition. And what, if you look across the country in each of these RTOs, what you see are highly qualified companies competing against each other. You're seeing um, very qualified incumbent utilities moving into other regions that are not in their backyard. And at the same time, you're seeing highly qualified new entrants um, with strong parent companies that are moving into um, these markets as well. And so a, a key success so far I think we've seen is um, just the quality of the bidders um, when you have these Order 1000 windows. Another thing in terms of focus on this slide that we've seen is that we believe that competition is bringing commercial innovation and it's bringing qualified companies and then when the windows are happening and we'd say there's not enough windows but when the windows are happening the marketplace and com commercial innovation is um, is present and the common trend whether or not it's in MISO, New York, PJM, SPP or California name the market and cost commitment and cost containment bids are present in each of these markets across the country. And so when you have these Order 1000, the marketplace is responding with cost caps. And that's um, a trend um, and that's a, re a legal record, quite frankly, in each of these markets um, across the country. So for example, in MISO, they had um, um, their first order uh, MISO Order 1000 um, process um, about a year and a half ago. And this data on this um, spreadsheet is pulled from the MISO selection report. So it's the actual MISO information. And so what this shows is that in this Duff Coleman bid, which is in Kentucky and Indiana, there were 11 bidders. And in this particular RFP in MISO, you saw that there were um, six of the 11 bidders put some sort of cost cap or cap on their ROE that they would ultimately file at FERC. An additional three of the 11 bidders um, said that they would um, provide certainty on their capital structure. An additional 10 of the 11 bidders said that they would uh, bid in a binding construction cost cap or on this sheet implementation cost. And in that it also includes not only the new entrants that are doing this, in this particular bid, it was new entrants and incumbents. And so a fact pattern that we're seeing is that when you have these order 1000 bids, it's not only the new entrants that are bidding in some sort of uh, construction cost cap, but you're also seeing the incumbents do that as well.
and we thought and thought that was an interesting trend. In this particular bid, you saw one bidder bid some sort of cap on their O&M. And then in addition on the same bid, you saw five out of the 11 bidders take some sort of form of the inflation rate risk on the project, which is clearly a key input in the cost of these projects. And additional two bidders put some sort of cap on their uh, rate concessions. Next slide. And then this is an update on um, just on breaking news in terms of on the MISO side. But again, this slide is reflective of what we've seen in California, what we've seen in PJM, what we've seen in New York. Um, MISO, we saw it in SPP. It's not just MISO. So in this recent MISO window for a project in East Texas that was awarded to NextEra, from the MISO selection report, we saw 11 out of the 12 bidders that are listed here in this chart, 201 to 212, 11 out of the 12 bidders bid some sort form of a capital cost cap, four out of the 12 bids forego um, AFUDC, an additional nine out of 12 bids uh, forego QIP, um, four out of the 12 bids took routing risk change as part of in, included in their construction cost cap, and the CAP ROE bids were around 9.8%, with a range on the bids going from 9.75% to 10.7%. 11 out of 12 bids provided a capital structure guarantee. Seven out of the 12 bids put some form of an O&M cap, although there were differences in the duration of those caps. And then five out of the 12 bidders put some sort of annual revenue requirement cap. And again, there were differences on the terms of these caps as well. Another trend that we're seeing in each of these markets is that this financial innovation that is coming as a part of the Order 1000 processes, it is requiring that the RTOs develop new skill sets um, in terms of evaluating the bids. Um, and because all of a sudden, they're having to look at construction cost caps versus estimates, um, looking at ROEs and comparing that against other bidders, looking at the legal language um, in the binding cost caps as part of their evaluation process. And so we are seeing new capabilities that um, are, are needed to properly evaluate at these Order 1000 windows. So at the same time, say in PJM, um, they are in the process of putting together comparative frameworks on exactly how they will look at this in bids. And um, different RTOs are also expressing preferences on what sort of cost containment they want to see and don't want to see as a part of the bids. For example, in PJM, they're saying they really are not interested in at this juncture in going down the path of looking at um, O&M caps. And so um, they are, in terms of as they're writing and putting their procedures together on how they look at cost containment, um, they're having to, to factor through that. And um, But I think there's a robust discussion that's occurring in each of the regions on how you evaluate cost containment. And, um, and I also think that you're seeing consumer groups in some of these regions, but not all, we're seeing consumer, some of the consumer groups become very engaged also in the details um, of this as well. Next slide. And I would say that um, th those are the consumer benefits that we're seeing from Order 1000 and the quality of the pool in these bids are real, in our minds, real uh, bidders um, are, that in our minds, are real selling point um, on some on some of the what's happened in Order 1000, and when we look at what needs to be improved, we think about um, the challenges in our mind is that there's just not enough competitive windows right now. And as we look at when Order 1000 was initially implemented, the United States model was basically to compete new greenfields, to compete regionally cost allocated. 
um, and regionally planned project um, to accommodate and recognize state laws and in some markets to, um, to uh, compete projects above a certain voltage level. And basically, as these projects went through, the, the compliance projects went, the plans went through the FERC process, there were a lot of carve-outs to the original policy of Order 1000. And so we look at what's happened in terms of the lack of windows right now. And we don't think that the problem in Order 1000 was the policy itself. We think that the problem is that there were too many carve outs um, in the compliance process that were granted um, that were granted in the individual regions. And that's why we're not seeing um, as, as many windows um, as, uh, as, as there could be. And we think from a policy standpoint, the key is addressing those carve outs that were granted in the Order 1000 compliance process, but that the policy of competition in Order 1000 was actually very sound and was upheld by, all, by the courts as well. And we would also say that, you know, the United States model is not is uh, is is uh, is one way that transmission competition has occurred, but certainly other countries as well are looking at comp transmission competition models as well, and have come out with different choices and outcomes because they've had different models. And so, for instance, if you look at um, the UK, they are also at their infancy stage in their own version of Order 1000 for onshore transmission development. And their proposal is basically projects above a certain cost amount all go out for competition. And, um, and so it's a little different than, say, in the United States, where the competition policy has been tied to regional cost allocation. And so our main point here is that the details of the policy choices on how to open up transmission competition has resulted in, um, in some of the lack of windows. But the policy of competition, in our view, is a good policy. Next slide. Another thing that happened after Order 1000 um, went into effect is that we saw in a number of states primarily in the heartland um, area of the United States, um, a number of state laws um, that were passed um, that essentially reinstated um, the right of first refusal that FERC eliminated. But the, right, the state right of first refusal was put in place in, in a state law versus um, at the federal level. And so um, these states include um, the, the, the states that are shaded in pink um, on the slide here. And so that's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Oklahoma. <clears throat> There's an, uh, a time limit on the Alabama Rofer. Um, in Oklahoma, there's a voltage um, floor as well. And, um, and then in Indiana, there's a partial Rofer on the MISO side of Indiana. Um, and a, uh, a, a, a different type of rofer on the PJM side of Indiana. And so we would also say that um, some of these state laws have also limited the number of windows that we've seen. Um, and in 2019, this issue is going to continue to work its through, way through the legal process. And um, the, the, the uh, law in Minnesota that passed, um, it has been challenged um, and is pending before the Eighth Circuit right now. And, um, and so um, we're in the middle of the briefing period um, for, um, for that particular litigation. And um, it is uh, being challenged on the basis that um, the law is not consistent with the US Constitution and is in violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. And so the legal briefs and the arguments uh, related to that particular um, law will play out in 2019 um, and also, um, you know, impact the policy debate 
um, relating to these state regulations and laws. Uh, next slide. And so when we think through where, where are things going and where should the policy go, we would kind of boil it down to, to uh, four main areas that we're focused on, although I would mention these are pretty big uh, areas, but kind of four main areas in that we would say uh, to further competition policy in the United States, we would, that FERC, we would say FERC policy should expand the number of competition windows. We think and would like to see FERC policy to continue to support cost containment and its strong role in the selection process, and that it's very critical that the regions continue to develop the capabilities to analyze cost cap proposals, as well as really developing the frameworks on how you look at cost estimates versus cost caps in the bids. And, um, and that's gonna be critical to seeing the consumer benefits of competition come into play is really developing the, the rigor in uh, the cost evaluation process. And then third, the third bucket we would say is that FERC policy should support reducing the order 1000 carve outs, expanding the windows. We're seeing a um, tremendous growth in the number of supplemental projects um, are, um, that are being submitted into the planning process. Uh, there's a number of complaints on the on the topic that um, are, are pending rehearing and how the policy plays out relating to the supplemental projects is also very important um, in terms of uh, driving productive uh, competition policy. And then we would also look at voltage restrictions that occur um, in many of the tariffs, not all, but many of the tariffs um, uh, in terms of at the regional level. And we think that um, some of these uh, voltage restrictions need to be uh, re-examined um, as well. But really, um, FERC approved the compliance filings on a region by region basis. And so a lot of the answers here in the competition policy are thinking, are, are really analyzing the details of each region and then seeing what makes sense uh, from there. And then lastly, as I mentioned on the previous slide, that we believe that meaningful discussion on the state ROFR laws is needed. And, um, and we, we think that that will continue to happen um, in 2019. Um, I mentioned the Minnesota ROFR case, and um, it'll be interesting to see that how it plays out. And I would also mention that the United States, um, the, the Department of Justice on behalf of the United States recently filed an amicus brief in the Eighth Circuit case as well. And the Department of Justice asserted that by allowing the RTOs to consider state laws in their selection process, um, that the federal government, including FERC, did not authorize or approve state ROFR laws. And so the, uh, the briefs um, and the legal arguments that have been raised against the state right of first refusal laws by the Department of Justice um, are also interesting uh, to to uh, to read and to um, uh, and, and, and to get their perspective. But with that, I appreciate the opportunity to provide some comments and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sharon. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, now we're going to hear from Johannes Feifenberger, who's a principal at the Brattle Group. He's been working in this realm of electrical engineering and is an economist over the past 25 years with a lot of experience in the areas of regulatory economics and finance. As you'll see in his presentation, uh, he's one of the co-authors of a very recent paper that explores this process of competitive transmission uh, development and looks uh, hard at the numbers that we're seeing so far coming from those competitive developments. Uh, he's got his uh, master's in economics from Brandeis University, also a master of science in electrical engineering and energy economics from the University of Technology in Vienna, Austria. And um, Johannes is participating with us today from far away in, a, in another time zone, but we welcome him and thank you for joining us, Johannes. 
Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and thank you for the other panelists uh, for a wonderful introduction. So we wanted to explore the experience with these competitive processes today and what those experiences mean with respect to potential cost savings in the transmission space. So Tom, if we could go to slide three. And for those listening in, uh, there's a lot of detail in these slides, so I will just give you the highlights uh, if, if you want to dive in to that level of detail, I think you can download the full presentation from the NRI uh, webpage. Um, as the overall summary, I really want to make two points, um, or use two slides to make several points here. Slide three here shows how much transmission has been built in each of the RTOs. And we looked at the RTOs because the RTOs are really the only place where competition is happening at all, if, if it's happening even at the RTO level. And uh, what this slide shows is that, for example, taking the biggest bar, PGM, the last five years have seen about $31 billion in transmission investment. But of that, only about 46% of transmission of that transmission investment is actually going through the RTO planning process. The other half, the 54% are what's called supplemental projects in PGM that are just planned by the local transmission owner and are usually implemented with uh, only cursory review through the planning process to make sure it uh, keeps the system reliable. So from the outset, uh, of all the transmission investments that we have, which was about 75 billion in the last five years within the ISOs, about 100 billion with all FERC jurisdictional entities, half of them go through the planning process. And if you look at how many of them were competitively bid out, you see these uh, small gray bars next to the large bars, and you can see that. Um, what has been bid out to date has been very limited. Only about 2% of those $75 billion in transmission investment have been subject to competitive processes to date. Let's go to slide four. So we looked at um, all the projects that have been bid out and also the projects that have not been bid out. Um, what we found was a quite stunning discrepancy on the extent to which uh, the cost of competitive proje projects as bid differed from the cost of non-competitive projects. And we were able to compare the winning bids to initial ISO cost estimates. And we found that the winning bids on average came in about 40% below the initial CalISO estimates. Whereas for non-competitive projects, those projects were completed at about 34% above initial cost estimates. So if you look at this, you got a 55% gap in, in costs. That's a stunningly large gap. Now, will that mean that the winning bids, the competitive projects will be implemented at, at the bid? Well, not. Probably not because there are inflation and other factors that might um, increase those bid costs. But even if they were to increase 34%, like the non competitive bids, you would still have a 40% price difference between implementing competitive projects and implementing non competitive projects. Now, what does that mean with respect to customer savings? Well, right now it doesn't mean much because. So few projects have been bid out, only about 2% of all transmission investment. But if the 2% could be expanded to a third of all transmission investments, and the long-term savings would, even, would only be half of that 55% difference, uh, you would get customer benefits of about $8 billion over five years. Um, now, it's clear that customers will benefit from lower costs, 
but we also feel that transmission owners would benefit from lower costs because there's increasingly rate pressure on transmission investments. Many state commissions are getting concerned about by, uh, how fast transmission costs have been increasing. But more importantly, transmission is under competition from increasingly lower cost alternatives as batteries and uh, distributed energy resources and renewables in general have come down as gas prices have stayed low, the value of transmission has been reduced. So for transmission to be a cost competitive uh, solution to our infrastructure, our energy infrastructure, it's actually beneficial for transmission costs to come down too. And if you're a transmission owner and want to build projects, uh, it's much more likely that these projects will get built if they're more cost competitive. Um, so let me uh, quickly scan through the rest of the slides. Tom, um, if we could go to slide six. Um, I want to stress that competitive transmission does not mean merchant transmission. These are uh, regulated projects that are being bid out. So once these competitive projects get bid, they become part of the um, regulated cost recovery. Uh, that I find is a distinction that uh, is often not fully appreciated, whereas merchant transmission projects don't have regulated cost recovery, but they need to recover their costs through bilateral contracts or other means. Um, on slide seven, I just want to stress that the US is not the only country to uh, have experience with transmission. Uh, there are two, two ISOs in Canada, Alberta, and Ontario. They have also uh, some experience with competitive transmission, uh, similar in scale to how things happening in the US. But internationally, there's more. Brazil, for example, has been bidding out every major transmission project since about 1999. Uh, there are some other Latin American countries with similar experience of just Chile. And as Sharon had said, the UK has started to uh, tend to uh, bid out offshore transmission projects, but they're expanding this now into the onshore grid. Slide eight. Um, this is the transmission investment of FERC jurisdictional entities uh, since the 1990s. And you see that transmission investments have, in fact, increased significantly. Uh, there are benefit cost studies showing that, you know, despite the fact that we are investing about $20 billion a year in transmission, the customer savings. Uh, from making markets more competitive, allowing uh, low-cost renewables to access markets that exceed the transmission investments. But nevertheless, this is uh, 10 times more today than we've invested in the 1990s. Of course, the 1990s saw very low investment because uh, most of the transmission grid was built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And there was just a lull uh, in the 1990s after that build-out in the earlier decades. Um, slide nine uh, gives you more detail on how transmission has been built. Uh, the ISOs, including ERCOT, uh, account for about 85% of all investments, and investment growth in the ISO has exceeded those in non-ISO areas, uh, where the ISOs have grown by about 10 to 16% a year uh, since the uh, late 90s, while non-ISO areas have grown about 6 to 10% annually. Um, let's go to slide 11, please. There are different uh, competitive models, and this is a quick summary of that. One is a solutions-based model, and one is a project-based model. The solutions-based model basically says, here's a transmission need will bid out, will bid this out to um, the industry and you can provide different solutions and we select the solution that we like the best. Whereas project-based solicitation uh, is what CalISO is doing, for example, and most of the other ISOs are doing where 
the ISO go through the planning process, specifies the specific project, the specific solution they would like to see, and then bid out that uh, project. And that's the approach taken in California in MISO as the BERCOT uh, when um, the, the the Quest projects were bid out uh, Brazil, Alberta, and Ontario. On slide 12, that just gives you a summary of how much has been bid out. As you can see, CalISO has bid out the largest share of its uh, transmission investment that is about 6.8%, including all the projects, including the supplemental projects that are not even going through the ISO planning process. ISO New England has not yet bid out anything. Um, SPP has bid out one project that uh, is no longer needed. And MISO had built out one project when we did this study and has just uh, completed this, the bidding process for a second project. New York ISO uh, has bid out uh, one project, but uh, the transmission investment in New York, New York ISO has been much less. Slide 30, if you're interested, shows a list of the individual projects. Um, TGM is a little hard to um, characterize here because PGM has a different process where over the last uh, four years, uh, or between 2013 and 2016, 600 project proposals were bid into the process, of which between 37 and 50 percent were submitted by non-incumbent. But of those proposals, many of them were from incumbents, and PGM has awarded about 16 projects to those incumbents and about two to non-incumbents. Uh, slide 14 gives you a summary of the exclusion criteria. Uh, that apply to competitive processes. And to give you a read on this, MISO, for example, uh, does not allow any reliability projects to be bid out. Uh, the exclusions for voltage levels, the exclusions for upgrades and existing right of ways, uh, the exclusions for you know, locally allocated costs. And these exclusions really are the reasons why so few of the transmission investment has been subject to competitive processes. But you can also see from that table that uh, New York, for example, um, is bidding out more of the projects. There are fewer exclusions in New York and California than there are in, say, MISO or PGM or SBP. Um, slide 15 gives you more detail on the comparison of bid costs to initial cost estimates. Uh, you can see that in MISO, for example, they had one project that was bid at 15% below initial estimates. Um, in New York, it was about 22% below, uh, in this case, the lowest cost bid from an incumbent. But you can see while these numbers vary across the ISOs, they're all quite sizable in terms of um, bids below uh, initial estimates of project costs. But most importantly, these bids, while they have some exclusions for cost increases, often include cost caps that reduce uh, subsequent cost escalations. Slide 16 gives you a summary of how uh, non-competitive project costs in final implementations have compared to initial cost estimates. And you can see here that um, the weighted average is 34%, but that uh, ranges from about 18% in MISO and SPP, which might be approximately inflation rates between when the initial estimate was um, made and the final project cost, an 18% escalation, uh, while in some of the other ISOs, CAL ISO and ISO New England, uh, in 
non-competitive projects have been completed at between 40 and 70 percent in above initial estimates. Um, so let's skip to slide 18. Uh, Maestro has very recently, in the last few weeks, um, completed its second competitive project uh, solicitation. Sharon has briefly mentioned that, so I will uh, just do a few highlights here. Um, the winning bid in 19 in 2018 dollars was 15 percent below MISO initials initial bid estimate. Uh, the winning bid in this case was Nextera. They offered a construction cost cap that was at the uh, inflation adjusted future cost of uh, about 115 million dollars. It included an ROE cap, um, which resulted together with the lower bid and an analyzed cost of 11% below the median bid. Um, my, but MISO also noticed that uh, they received a lot of good bids from very high, highly qualified bidders and the process resulted in an outcome of this project having a benefit cost ratio of 2.2 while um, its own initial estimate of this particular project was 1.35. So the bidding process significantly increased the benefit cost ratio of the whole project. And then to conclude, let me just stress again um, on slide 19 that there are significant customer benefits, but only if the competitive processes can be applied to a larger share of the transmission investments. And ultimately, more cost-effective transmission not only benefits customers, but will also benefit transmission owners by keeping transmission a more attractive solution to enhance wholesale power market efficiencies and integrate renewables and compete with uh, non-transmission alternatives. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Johannes. And uh, again, I want to invite the audience to send in any questions that you've got by typing them in to the question tab on your GoToMeeting um, little control area on your computer screen. I've got a couple questions already, and um, these relate to what Johannes was just talking about. And um, I invite anybody to answer, but Neil, in one of your slides early on, you talked about having all these bidders meet the functional specifications. And um, that's one thing I wanted to see if we can clarify a little bit. How is it that we can be sure that the functional specifications that we name are going to make sure that these projects will meet the needs that have been identified by the uh, planners? Let's start with that. You'll have to unmute yourself if you're ready to talk, Neil. Well, I'm sorry, Neil is apparently having some trouble unmuting himself. Uh, anybody else want to take a stab at the same question? Uh, presenters, you can just unmute yourself so that you're ready to talk. Yeah, let me uh, start while well, maybe Neil and others can chime in. Um, in many cases, the projects and project specifications are very clearly specified or uh, defined by the ISO. Um, it usually includes, of course, the route of the project, the voltage level, um, and most selection criteria will evaluate the design of the project to make sure that the project specifications meet the uh, needs and standards of the ISO. Okay, it's a, it seems um, a little bit tricky at this point, maybe just because we don't have very much experience with it yet, but um, can anybody address then how does that work if we have 
multiple kinds of different solutions being proposed. Uh, what if there's uh, a non-wire alternative or storage or distributed resources being proposed to solve the same kind of problem that could also be solved by a wire alternative? Are we at the point yet where um, competition is starting to show how that can work? I'll take a stab at that. Um, Sharon Stegner from LS Power. I think that generally what we're seeing across the country is that the initial order 1000 windows have been very focused on transmission versus transmission competition. Uh, I think that um, order 1000, in, in our view, clearly left the door open for the transmission planning process to um, consider not only transmission, but non-transmission non alternatives as part of their regional planning process. To date, we haven't seen a lot of advancement um, on that particular area of Order 1000, um, but you are seeing um, limited, but some, examples of folks bidding in combinations of, say, transmission and storage. Um, into some of these um, into some of these order 1000 windows um, and you, you definitely are seeing um, a few nibbles here and there and the, the you know this at the kind at the very much at the infancy stage um, and I I think that over the next couple of years I do believe that um, transmission versus non-transmission alternatives, will be something that um, evolves more in the order 1000 processes. Thank you. Yeah, Anybody else? Add, it's Neil here. I, yeah, I'd like to comment on that too, if I could. Yes, please. Well, uh, yeah, I, I was just wanting to point out that there seems uh, there seems to be an, an assumption here is that the only way the non-transmission alternatives will come up is if they appear in the competitive solicitation process. That isn't the way we've been doing it. When we're looking at our transmission planning process up front and identifying the solutions, we do also explore uh, what would not be considered conventional transmission solutions. So combinations of preferred resources in the state, uh, and that includes a pretty broad range of, of possible uh, inputs. Now, our our Board of Governors can't actually approve those, but to this point, when we've identified that some other alternative other than building wires is, is a better solution overall, we ask our Board to approve that finding and then we work with a relevant state agency to actually get those resources procured. So it doesn't have to go through the uh, ISO competitive solicitation process either for those types of solutions to be identified or to actually be implemented. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and I, I should clarify, I think Hannes mentioned that in our, uh, in the, uh, when we're putting out a functional specification for a project that it includes the identification of the right of way. That's actually pretty rare. Uh, normally the only time a right of way would be a step already known as a given as if it was a modification to an existing facility that's already there and already occupying a right of way, in which case it's probably being assigned to an incumbent as opposed to being eligible for competitive solicitation. Yeah, there was another question that's come up about this is um, because the incumbents already have rights of way, does that give them an ultimate advantage in this kind of a process? Um, you know, obviously it, it took a lot of um, time and effort to establish the right of way, um, then is there a way to open that up to competition in construction? And how would it be different from the incumbent uh, going out to ask for competitive bids before it builds a project? Yeah, um, this is Sharon Segner from LS Power. Um, you know, different states, have approached this issue differently because obviously the right to weigh issue is, is under state law. And, you know, there, um, I think that there's some very interesting precedent in the state of uh, New York, um, but New York is not alone. Um, that basically New York has taken the position that if the incumbents um, have the right of way, that um, it's actually that the uh, the ratepayers um, in New York 
pay for that right away. And, um, and so therefore, New York has, has basically said that the rights away uh, must be opened up. And um, it's not just in New York, there's a number of states that have taken that position. Um, but I will, uh, I think it's fair to say it's really a state by state determination and you have to look at um, what the legal construct is in each individual state. Yeah, I'm finding that a very interesting idea. And one of the things that I was noticing from the whole presentations today is that we're seeing a lot of this early action in the places with the single state ISO, California, and now you're mentioning New York. So I wonder, um, you know, what does it take to push these projects across the finish line more in the multi-state RTO areas where, you know, maybe the issues are more difficult to address? Anyone want to address that well, question? I mean, from a from an LS power standpoint, we have um, we have been fortunate enough to win several of these Order 1000 projects, and um, some are in single state I ISOs, and then others in MISO and PJM are projects that involve multiple states. Duff Coleman was in Kentucky and Indiana. Artificial Island was Delaware and New Jersey. Um, and so you have you know, multiple jurisdictions involved. And so on the issue of the rights away, um, you know, generally, but not always, um, if an entity applies to be a state public utility as part of their CPCN application, often, um, you know, often that with that public utility uh, status comes um, the ability to acquire land. Um, but it's not always the case. And, um, and and I don't know that the issue relating to right away is necessarily tied to a multi-state um, RTO. I think it really is an issue of, you know, unfortunately you have to work with the lawyers and drill down on what the individual laws are in each state and the legislative state legislative history and uh, work through it in that process. But um, when I said in New York what happened, it was actually, uh, I believe the initial order in New York came from the, the PSC. Uh, relating to uh, their views on rights away. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Yeah, if I could also, if, if I could also add, um, having right of way doesn't exclude a competitive process, right? Because if this is a new project, uh, some people might have a cost advantage if they already have right of way, so it might be easier to win the competitive uh, solicitation if right of way is, is an issue even in cases like outside New York where right-of-ways usually aren't transferred uh, to the winning bidders. Um, so I think the distinction here is that sometimes projects are not being bid out if they are an upgrade uh, or related to an existing facility. So it pre pretty much needs to be a new regional project for uh, competitive solicitations to become active and then as we said earlier the voltage threshold there uh, well, thresholds like no reliability need is ever bid out in MISO and so on. I also want to say early on I might have misspoken but the project specific bidding is specifying that a project needs to go from point A to point B so it it basically has a, uh, it's a well-defined project in terms of its endpoints. Uh, that doesn't mean that bidders couldn't bid alternative routes, which they usually do. And on non-transmission alternatives, if I might just add, um, they have to be considered if proposed during the planning process. So just like Neil has explained in CalISO, these non-transmission alternatives are considered during the planning process and the planning process might then determine that the transmission solution is the preferred solution. Um, in places like New York, where the need is bid out, um, there's, there's no requirement that the need be addressed through a transmission solution. It could be a generation solution, it could be storage demand response and so on. 
we just haven't seen enough competitive solicitations where non-transmission solutions uh, would have been selected as part of the competitive solicitation process. But most of that is done before projects are even bid out. All right, very good. That helps me to understand better. I really appreciate the discussion, everyone. Um, I want to give each person a chance to make some final comment, and I think it's it's good if we go in reverse order of the presentations. So uh, we'll get to you last, Commissioner Wellinghoff, if you're, you'll be ready. Um, Johannes, do you want to sum up anything else that you didn't get a chance to say that you want to go over? And then for the audience, if you watch your screen, I'm presenting um, two slides that talk about the next upcoming uh, webinars, one for the NARUC Center for Partnerships and Innovation, and then another one for NRRI. Uh, go ahead, Johannes. Yeah, I would just like to say that um, for the competitive process to be expanded, and I think the experience to date shows that we it has a lot of potential for cost savings and for making transmission more cost effective. But whether that will happen or not will greatly depend on the state commissions, I believe, because the state commissions will have a lot of influence on the criteria that are applied, not just in single state ISOs, but also in multi state ISOs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sharon, do you have any last words? You're uh, still on mute. You'll have to unmute. Sure. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide a few um, closing comments. Um, I guess the two things that, that stand out is um, certainly we would agree with the Brattle Group's um, conclusions that the state commissions and their voices are in the consumer interest are key um, in terms of in this debate. Um, but we would also say that um, clearly, you know, FERC is also key. And we were greatly encouraged um, several months ago. Um, Chairman Chatterjee gave a speech um, in New York um, City this summer talking about his views on Order 1000 and um, his belief in the need to double down on competition um, as it related to Order 1000. And um, we think that um, this is a, um, a positive uh, uh, positive. It was positive feedback to hear, and um, we think that leadership is needed um, both at the state commission level, and, and we're appreciative of the leadership we've seen as well. Um, we, that leadership is needed um, both at the federal level at FERC and at the state commission level. And the other thing I might add is that, well, I think that the non-RTO regions um, are, um, you know, are probably further behind than some of the RTO regions in the number of windows that they've had, it's not to say that they haven't had windows. Um, and, um, and certainly there, there have been windows in the nine RTO regions. Um, and I would say it's interesting to us, I mean, if you could look at Florida and the FRCC, they, you know, there's lively debates going on on how you look at cost containment and how do you analyze it? Well, those very same debates are happening down in the FRCC um, and in their stakeholder process. And because they've had, you know, cost caps come into their um, order 1000 windows uh, down there um, and, um, you know, incumbents moving into other incumbents territories as they're, as they're uh, looking at uh, projects. So, I wouldn't um, say that the non-RTOs are devoid um, of action. Um, there's actually been some, some interesting data points um, in those areas um, as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Neil, any final words? Sure, it's Neil here, thank you. I think my, my biggest concern, and I have to express it as a concern, is that I've heard some pretty big sweeping generalizations today that actually are a bit troubling. You know, the comments about expanding what's eligible for competition on well, the ISO footprint, uh, we don't think going in and um, modifying an existing owner's facilities is something that can reasonably be bid out from an engineering perspective. And there is a lot of emphasis on making the best use of existing facilities um, 
as opposed to building new greenfield projects from an environmental and cost perspective. So I think we have to be careful about some, using some of those terms about what, what it actually means. And I think the same applies actually to the right-of-way discussion. It's a bit different if there's an existing empty right-of-way that has room for some new facility versus a project that's actually the uh, teardown rebuild of an existing facility and utilizing a right-of-way that's already there. So, the, like I said, some of these, uh, the concepts I generally agree with, but there have been some sweeping generalizations that uh, could spell a lot of confusion and trouble for a lot of us that actually we think have been moving forward fairly effectively and putting projects out for competition that should. So uh, we're going to have to keep a close eye on this discussion, I'm afraid, as we go forward because we do not want to get swept up in something that uh, is fixing problems we don't have. Okay, that makes sense to me. Let's not fix problems that we do not have. Uh, Commissioner Wellinghoff, any final words from you? Yes, thank you, Tom, very quickly. I, and I want to thank all my other fellow presenters for very fine presentations. And actually, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, and I think it's very encouraging, you know, for example, what Kaiso has been able to do and Neil and his group. And I've been actually working with them very closely on something called SATA storage as a transmission asset and they're they're moving along there I think in, in a very positive direction and and I think you know what we have to balance is what Neil's talking about is the practicalities of the everyday uh, issues of the planner and the transmission owners and how we can actually make these things work versus the vision I think that FERC had with respect to competition in transmission and how we can make it more robust and I think Johannes's presentation makes it clear that there's a long, long way further to go down the road. And I think we all have to do more there. I think FERC has more to do perhaps with opening up uh, Order 1000 and, uh, and considering uh, modifications in certain ways. I think at the ISO level, uh, certainly uh, there's more that can be done with the actual planning process there and making that process more open, transparent, and available to uh, these uh, competitive providers. And then certainly from the state perspective, I think the uh, states uh, can provide uh, some uh, political and regulatory support uh, to drive down costs for consumers, as, as again, Johannes has shown in his presentation is what is possible with respect to these uh, competitive processes. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to working with everybody and seeing if we can can uh, really realize that that potential that that I think FERC had envisioned when they uh, issued Order 1000. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you all very much for pre your presentations today and for participating. Audience, I see you stuck with us right up until the end. We had uh, about 50 different connections to the webinar today. I uh, hope you learned a lot, as we all did. And um, I've got on the screen now the next uh, NARUP Center for Partnerships and Innovations webinar about uh, water thermoelectric energy nexus is Monday, December 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. There's information about that on the NARUC CPI website. And then the next NRRI webinar will be on January 23rd about addressing secondary contaminants in water systems. So thank you everyone for your participation today and we'll see you at the next webinars.